My name is Michael Thigason. Uh, I do camera and lighting. Paul asked me to go through basic C-stand techniques and safety protocols with you. Uh, C-stands are awesome. You can do so many things with them on set. You can put lights on there. You can put diffusion, flags. Uh, you can even hold boom pulls on it if you want. So many things, uh, great tool. So today we're gonna put a flag on an arm off of the C-stand, something you might do to maybe block a light or block a lens flare coming into a camera. Um, sometimes on bigger sets, you might even put a flag out to shade a director from the sunlight. So I've got my black duotine flag to block the lights. Got a sandbag. I've got a knuckle and an arm. Most arms come with a permanent knuckle on there. So first, knuckle goes on top. Now, before we put any real weight on here, you want to put a sandbag on the legs. So there's three legs down here at the bottom. Come, come down with me. Come down. You want to put the sandbag on the tallest leg. That way, all of the weight from the sandbag is on the C-stand and not on the ground. If you put it on a lower one, that bottom of that sandbag would touch the ground. So a lot of that weight would be kind of useless. So always on the tallest leg. Let's go back up. It's like Mr. Rogers. Won't you be my filmmaker? All right, so I'm gonna put the arm in the loosened knuckle here, like that. Tighten it up a little bit. Now you always want the weight going to the right of the knuckle, okay? Uh, we're gonna put the flag on this knuckle on the arm, so it's going to the right. You don't wanna put it to the left because Especially if you put something heavy on here, like a light, eventually gravity is going to slowly pull that down and it's going to get more and more loose until it goes down, falls, and hurts someone, okay? So you always want it to go to the right of the knuckle, not to be confused with the smaller knob on the back that attaches it to the actual seat stand itself, the big knuckle knob. All right, we're going to loosen up this one, put the flag on there. Uh, there's multiple holes on the knuckle. I don't know if you can see this. You got a, a big hole, a medium hole, and a couple tiny holes. Uh, you want to use the one according to what you're attaching. Obviously, the flag's a little bit smaller, so we're going to put it in one of the smaller holes. There's the flag. Tighten that up a little bit. Cool. Uh, now, the last thing to do is the direction of the weight. You also want that tall leg that we put the sandbag on earlier to be going in the same direction as well. Right now, it's not doing that. So I'm going to just loosen that bottom knob, lift it up, twist the bottom so that the sandbag down here on the leg is facing that same direction as the flag up here. That way, it's weighted at the center of gravity, so it's less likely to fall over. If we reverse that and have the leg with the sandbag going in one direction and the flag going in the opposite, it's more likely to tip over, fall, and hurt someone. It's definitely not as sturdy. So little things like that are really, really important. Uh, obviously, this flag is not super heavy, but once you start putting heavier things like lights, um, it becomes very, very important because you don't want this falling down. I mean, these things are metal, it's gonna hit someone in the head, it can seriously injure them, or it can break equipment, which is also not a good thing. Now that we have our flag on there, we're gonna be talking about raising it and lowering. You always wanna raise it with the top knob first here. Okay, so loosen that up a little bit. Don't ever over loosen these things or over tighten anything in the film world. Uh, it's a good way to break things. So just loosen enough to work, um, and then lift up that first level. And once that's there, I recommend not going all the way to the top because it's not going to be a very strong point here. If you bring it down just a little bit more like that, tighten it, then that pull internally is a little bit farther. So it's going to be a lot more sturdy versus if the pull's only down uh, uh, an inch below that level. Uh, and then you can lower the bottom level to keep going higher, watching it, making sure it's not hitting the ceiling or anything. Tighten it enough, tighten it enough before you walk away. Make sure it's all going in the same direction as the sandbag. Um, now, the reason you want to go in the order of those knobs, the reason you want to go in the order of those knobs is it just makes it easier. Let me, let me show you an example. If we, start, if we start with that bottom knob first, 
it's more difficult because we'll raise that bottom level. And then if we want to go higher, we can barely reach that top knob way up here. So you're only able to go an inch at a time. And it's actually, that's kind of difficult. And it's, it's harder and it's going to fall and pinch you or something uh, because you can't reach it. So I always want to do always want to do that top knob first. That way it makes things easier and a little bit safer for you. See stands. So that is C-Stand safety. Three-point lighting usually has three lights, key light, fill light, and a backlight of some sort. Um, personally, I like to do it using only two uh, lights using a key light and a backlight and then the fill light is actually just going to be a bounce board or a reflector to bounce and fill in those shadows a little bit instead of using three lights nine times out of ten you're interviewing people who aren't used to being on camera with a bunch of lights so i figure the less lights you use the more comfortable they're probably going to be instead of having a bunch of bright lights in their face uh, so we're just going to do one light in front is the key light uh, and start with that it's like an unboxing video can we have a top down camera <laughs> what do we got here? I like the red accent on these. They're pretty. Should snap it in. Usually you want the key light to be, I mean, at eye level of the subject or a little bit higher. I usually suggest a little bit higher. Natural lighting. In most situations are above our eyes, right? The sun's above us, lights and a ceiling are above us. So lights coming from eye level or below eye level is pretty unnatural. So striking. And you guys have these Sony's at the workshop, right? Yeah. Or the school. Cool. So there's our key light. It's lighting a little bit too much from the side. So I'm going to bring it in front of him a little bit. And Okay. So there's, there's our key light. Right. Uh, I could put another light on the other side for a fill light, but like I said, I'm going to use a bounce board to fill in those shadows. So as you can see, there's really, really dark shadows on this side, right? This light is coming over, I don't know, about 75% of his face. A little bit of shadows here. Can't really see it with a mask, but there would be shadows from his nose and his chin all kind of coming down at an angle this way. But these shadows are super dark, almost pitch black in the camera. So we're gonna bring in a bounce board. I got a little, uh, not quite a duckbill clamp, but a cheaper knockoff version of a duckbill clamp to hold. I want quite a bit of shadows. If we're doing uh, a pianist, a musician, dramatic lighting I think would be appropriate. Uh, if we were doing something where, you know, it was at an office for a company with just normal office workers, then you might do something a little more high key, less dramatic. But since he's a piano player in this example, uh, I think it's okay to make it a little dramatic. And you can even do it with one light, it's a little more difficult. You have to have a reflector for a fill like this one and then another one in the back all reflecting from one light source. But as soon as light hits this and bounces back to your uh, face, this is effectively the second light source. I get it. Yeah. Okay, I figured it out. And actually, speaking of that, I'm going to bring it a little bit more in front of you because it's almost backlighting you a little bit too much and it'll block that backlight that I'm about to put in. We're only at, I'm going to bring it just to 5% and see how that looks. Uh, by the way, this little foam piece that sticks in here is just to protect it when moving and during storage. Uh, it even says, please remove before use. So do not use these. These, they're LEDs so they don't get super hot, but after a while they will get hot enough to melt the foam. So definitely do not use these while the lights are on. Some, some people think they're used that as a snoot, which essentially turns it into a spotlight, uh, but those are metal. Uh, proper snoots are metal, those are foam. Don't do that. 
And another thing to keep in mind is these lights don't actually have bulbs that you can physically touch and exchange. Mm -hmm. So the conception of changing bulbs is really non-existent with these kinds of lights because you can control the intensity. The actual LED light in there, you actually you still don't want to touch it because it does get hot enough to where if your oils are on it, uh, it could be flammable, it could damage it. So you never want to touch the inside of that. That's why they have the plastic covers on when you store them. So I'm getting a little bit of lens flare from the backlight because that means the light's coming into the glass of my lens here. So it's creating a little bit of a, a lens flare. You can see it when I pan back and forth, kind of popping in and out right there from that light. So we want to get rid of that. And you can do that by either flagging the camera, which means we bring in another C-stand with a little flag just to block that light like I'm doing with my hand right now. Uh, or we can adjust the light flare. So I'm going to try to adjust the light path of least resistance. Let's see if I tilt it down a little bit like that and then raise it up. Top knob first on the C-stand, always the top knob first. Put it about there. Let's try that out. So the background is super black and boring. There's just a void back here, which could be okay in certain aspects uh, for certain projects, but it's kind of boring. Uh, it looks very two-dimensional. So I'm going to add some stuff back there, maybe some props, um, some practical lights always look nice in the background. So I'm going to add some stuff just to add some dimension to this shot. So I'm adding a little bit of diffusion cloth on the key light because it was way too hard, creating a lot of unpleasant shadows. And this softens it up a little bit, again, for... Uh, like a normal business, everyday interview, you might want to make it even more soft by adding another layer of diffusion in front of it. The farther away the diffusion is from the light source, the softer it'll be. Um, and also the closer the diffusion cloth to your subject, the softer it'll be. But I just want to soften it up a little bit with this. Uh, I still want it pretty dramatic. We still have the fill light bouncing that back. We still have our backlight. I added a CTO, an orange gel, color temperature orange gel to this one because I added a practical light and you'll see that in our shot. Uh, I added this in the background just to give it some depth and dimension um, and because it's kind of an orangish warm light, I put it a warm gel on here to kind of match it to make it look like this backlight is motivated by this light, okay? Uh, then I added a music stand with some paper on it. Uh, it's not even music, but whatever. And I taped <laughs> a little push light on there to make it look like uh, a light stand light and light it up because it looks kind of boring by itself and flat. So I have a couple of layers of the piano in the foreground in front of Paul. Uh, Paul, look at the interviewer for me. We have a couple of layers. We have the piano in front of Paul. We have Paul. We have the music stand here. We have the lamp here. And then I added a background light here and added some cine foil, which is basically just black aluminum foil that's heat resistant uh, and that you can shape into different shapes. And I tried to make it kind of a a straight line in the back, just kind of hitting this back wall. I added a blue gel so that it contrasts this warm gel hitting the back of him so he stands out from that background a lot more. Um, and it keeps the, the back wall from being just black and boring. It looks a lot better. I'm on a 35 millimeter lens right now, which is a fairly whitish lens. So we're seeing a lot of the back background. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a different lens on there, a telephoto lens. Uh, I might even go up to like 85 just to go super extreme, back the camera up and try to get approximately the same uh, shot composition, uh, but with an 85 and show you kind of what that difference is. All right, so I, instead of a 35 millimeter where the camera was up close, we now have an 85, camera's a little bit farther back. And if you look at the frame, and we'll cut to the footage here, you can see the music stand and the lamp in the background look a lot bigger in relation to Paul. Um, but because we're farther away from the piano, we're not able to see the piano keys anymore. That's kind of a downside. I kind of like the way they look, uh, piano keys look. So maybe the 35 might look better um, or somewhere in between, maybe uh, like a 50 or a 40 uh, would look good. So you get a little bit of both worlds. The plus side of this is it's a shallower depth of field. The lamp in the background and the, the light on the music stand give kind of a nice blurry look, uh, which again helps add dimension by making Paul stand out more from the background. 
by creating that blurriness, that shallow depth of field. Our key light, no fill, no backlight. Our props in the background look pretty dull and boring and underexposed. Adding in our fill. Helps fill in those shadows. Actually, I almost want to bring that even closer. Is it in the shot? Barely in the shot. Okay, back it up. Cool. That's out of the shot. Maybe I'll even raise it up a bit. And then our that's our key and our fill. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on, before the backlight, I'm going to turn on the practical light back here. And you can see that light by itself is not lighting him at all, right? There's, I mean, it's so dim. There's no way that could ever hit him on camera. So we'll turn on the backlight. And that kind of creates the illusion as if it's coming from here because it's the same warm color. And this almost does the same thing in a way. It's not quite as blue, but that's all right. This practical light here, turn that on to light the music. And then the backlight hitting the back wall almost kind of matches. This is a little bit more blue, but that's okay. And there's our three-point lighting. And I think that looks pretty good.